Well, are you ready to hear the word of the Lord this morning? Y'all don't sound like it. Make me feel good. Come on, make me feel good. <laughs> We're going to continue with another installment of um, the household of faith um, last week. We gave you an introduction. And we're going to go a little bit further this morning, but let's go ahead and pray and have our confession of faith, and then we'll get into uh, the remainder of the message. Father, thank you so much for allowing us to be here one more time. It's not because we're anything super special. It's simply because of your goodness, your mercy, and your grace. Father, we are about to sit down at the table and feast upon the bread of life this morning, the incorruptible seed which is your word that is forever settled in heaven. We pray this morning that you would allow revelation knowledge to flow freely in this place unhindered or uninterrupted by any satanic or demonic force. Touch our ears so that we can hear. Give us a mind so that we can understand. But most importantly, Father, I pray that we would take a few moments to examine ourselves. The Bible says we are to examine ourselves, specifically our hearts to make sure that there is nothing there that would prevent the word from doing exactly what it's supposed to do. Because Lord, you said if your word falls upon the good ground of a pure heart, of an honest heart, it will produce a harvest, some 30, some 60, and some a hundredfold. And so Father, we pray as David prayed, Lord, create within us a clean heart and renew a right spirit within us. Now, Father God, the only reason that we are still here Every single person in this building, the reason that we are still alive is because you are not done with us yet. You are the author and you are the finisher of our faith. And so we just ask you to continue to do a work in us. And God, you told Jeremiah the prophet, you said, before I formed you in the belly, I knew you, called you, and I sanctified you. And so, Father, I'm humbly asking you that what you saw me doing in eternity before I was ever placed in my mother's womb, before time ever began, I pray that what you saw planned and purposed for my life would manifest itself this morning here in the presence of your people. And in so doing, I pray that we all would give your name the glory and the honor. Hallelujah. Because this was not by power nor by might, but by your spirit. And even now, it is still wonderful and marvelous in our eyes. And so we thank you, Father, and we believe that we have received everything we just asked for. In the wonderful, the marvelous, the majestic, the matchless name of Jesus, King of kings and Lord of lords. And all that did agree said amen and amen. Please take your Bibles or any other electronic devices that you may have and uh, lift them up and repeat after me. This is my Bible. I am what it says I am. I have what it says I have. And I can do exactly what it says I can do. I am a believer. I'm not a doubter. I am a doer and not just a hearer. This is the word of faith for my life. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And I shall be all the better after having heard God's word. Do you truly believe that? Could I get you to just give him praise one more time? Will you stand with me to your feet this morning as we take a look at our foundational text that is found in Galatians chapter 6, and we're going to look at a couple of, uh, couple of verses there. Galatians chapter 6, verses 9 and 10. Y'all going to help Pastor read this morning? Let's go. And let us not be weary in well-doing. How many of you would like to know when due season is? Wouldn't it be nice if due season was a day and a time and you knew when when all of your sacrificial work was going to pay off? It says, let us not be weary in well-doing. All right, next verse says, as we have therefore opportunity. Let's read that again. That was kind of slow. Let's get on one accord. As we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. You may be seated this morning. And so we're doing another uh, installation on the household of faith. And and this morning, the subtitle of this message is, Do You Have Keys to the House? Has anybody asked you, do you have keys to the house? Um, Last week when we looked at this verse, we talked about uh, really community in the church and what it should feel like because we are a part of a family 
of believers, and it's referred to as the household of faith. The word household and the word families are used interchangeably, and they are synonymous with one another because households are made of families. And we said that there are certain things that you should experience in the house. In, in the house, if you cannot find love and affirmation anyplace else, you should be able to find love and affirmation in your own house. Uh, when the world has beat you up and you are mentally and physically tired, your house should be the place that you go to get rest from all of the, the drama and the noise of the world. It's a dangerous thing when a person doesn't want to go home because there's no peace in the house. Also, when you're in the house, um, there should be a sense of safety and protection in the house. I don't care what's going on out there. You are not going to come in my house and, uh, and, and do certain things. And so we said that we are a part of the... And, and you know, I got a comment that kind of... It, it, it made me feel bad. A lady made a comment. There were several comments on last week's message. And she said, everybody didn't have a household or a family like that. And that is the good news that we have come to bring to you today because once you come into the spiritual household that is called the household of faith, you should find love, you should find affirmation, you should find comfort, you should find safety, you should find peace. All of that should be in the house when we build community and do church the way that it's supposed to be done. Are you listening to me? But one of the most important things I said last week, because I'm about to transition, and I want you to follow me on this, um, because we're talking about how, to I how do I become a part of the household. Um, last week, we discovered that there are only two spiritual families. You all have heard this before. Most of you have. Have you ever heard anyone say, we're all God's children? Doesn't that sound nice and warm and fuzzy and so inclusive? However, it is not true. We are not all God's children. I'm going to show you this scripture, and then we're going to transition. Jesus said there are only two spiritual families. Now, this is important because we're not talking about a natural household. We're talking about a spiritual household. There's a difference between a natural household and a spiritual household. And Jesus said there are only two spiritual families in the world. And this is what's funny. I thought about this this week. The people that he said that belonged, that he was talking to, that he condemned, and that said they belonged to the devil's household, they weren't sinners. They weren't club goers. They weren't drug pushers. They were church people. He told church leaders, he said, you are of your father, the devil. That let, I'm going to leave that alone, but let's take, let's take a look at the scripture. Uh, let's take a look at John 8. 38 and 44, because it's important that we nail down this fact. We are not talking about a natural family. We're talking about a spiritual family. And the best commentary that I can give on that to differentiate between the two is if I recall the words of Jesus when he spoke to a man named Nicodemus. But right now, let's start with this. He says, now, now watch this in the very... I said 838 and 44. I need you to go to verse 38 and 44. Y'all have my notes back there, right? All right, let's hallelujah, salvation and glory. All right, he says, now watch this. He said, I, 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 I speak that which I have seen with my father, and you do that which you have seen of, with your father. Now stop right there. He talks about two different fathers. Now he hadn't said which one is which, but he lets you know right there that there are two spiritual families. That's it. Then keep going. They answered and said unto him, Abraham is our father. Jesus said unto them, if you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. Next verse, please. But now you seek to kill me, a man that has told you the truth. Why is it that when you tell the truth about a situation that people want to hate you? They want to say you're throwing shade. They want to say you're being petty. Why is it when you just tell the flat out truth? Do you know people will kill you to suppress the truth? Okay. And so he says, but you try to kill me, a man that has told you the truth, which I have heard of God. This did not Abraham. Abraham didn't try to kill me. You do the deeds of your father. Here again, he talks about patronage. He says, you do the deed of your father. Then said they unto him, we be, not, now this is important. He said, we be not born of fornication, but we have one father, even God. Why is that important? We are not born of fornication because they are speaking in reference to a natural birth and not a spiritual birth. All right, keep, next verse. 
Jesus said unto them, If God were your father, you would love me, for I proceeded forth and came from God. Neither came I of myself, but he sent me. Why do you not understand my speech? Even because you cannot hear my word. Next verse. You are of your father, the devil. Only two spiritual families. So no, we are not all God's children. If you are not in this house, and there's only one key, we're going to talk about that later on to get into this house. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth. And this is why God hates lying. He abode not in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. Do you, did you understand what I just read? And so Jesus clearly shows us that there are only two spiritual fathers, two spiritual households. Either you belong to the one and, or you belong to the other. Nicodemus wrestled with this concept. And so, we're, again, we're, what are we talking about today? Keys. Do you have keys to the house? Subtitle. Okay. Now look at this conversation that Jesus has with Nicodemus because Nicodemus uh, was struggling with this concept. Now it's important that you know who Nicodemus was. Nicodemus was a preacher. He was what we would call a preacher, uh, a religious leader of the day. And he belonged to a group of people called the Sanhedrin Council. These were people who persecuted the ministry of Jesus. The As a matter of fact, they were instrumental in the death of Jesus. And he belonged to them. And so what he does is, because he doesn't want his boys to know, is he sneaks away at nighttime and he comes to interview this young country preacher that's doing all of these miracles. So let's take a look at that. Uh, John chapter 3. John chapter 3. Um, you guys have my notes, right? Go to the Gospel of John chapter 3, the first eight verses. John chapter 3, hallelujah. It says, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus. Does anybody know what Nicodemus' name means in the Greek? A lot of you wear his shoes. Nike. Nicodemus means he who is victorious among his people. Nico, Nike, victory, all right? So he had a winning name from the start. He was a ruler of the Jews. Continue. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, now look at this. He condemns their entire assembly. Y'all missed this. What Nicodemus says condemns the entire assembly of the Sanhedrin and the Pharisees because he admits openly, we know who you are, but we'll never admit it. He says, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. Keep going. I'm showing you the difference between the natural birth and the spiritual birth because remember, how many spiritual families are we? Are there? And we want to make sure we're in the right household, right? Okay. And so he says, Jesus answered unto him and said, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. We could put the household of faith right there and it would be the same. He cannot enter the house of God. Nicodemus said, again, he's thinking on natural. Can I tell you something? You can't see spiritual concepts with natural eyes. That's how come you have people that aren't saved. They ridicule things that we do in the church because they're spiritual in nature and it doesn't make any sense to them because they're looking at a spiritual thing through natural lenses and it will never work. And so Nicodemus says, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Next verse. Where are you going? I'm preaching the gospel. Where are you going? Oh, okay, all right. <laughs> yeah. If you've never been here, we got it like that. All right, all right, let's go. All right. <laughs> Nicodemus saith unto him, how can a man be... All right, now, next verse. Go ahead, I'm sorry. Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of the warden of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Do you know the theologians have argued and fought over this one verse for years? And it is so, so simple. He's talking about two different births, one natural and one spiritual. The spiritual will never come before the natural. There will, this is another sermon I preach. Uh, you will always see the natural before you see the spiritual. And so he says, born of the water. Now, your natural birth, when all of us were born, unless you were in vitro or something, I think that it still applies there, um, we were in this watery space. Uh, and, and we call that, uh, you know, when a woman, what, what's that called? Em embryonic fluid. Isn't it amazing how God created us that we can live in that fluid, in that space, we can breathe the fluid, we can exhale the fluid, 
We can receive nutrients while we're there. But even though you can breathe that water and that fluid, as soon as you are born and you say, ah, you can never breathe water again. Okay. And so the, the indicator that a woman is getting ready to, to give birth, one of the indicators is that her water does what? It, it breaks because our natural birth is from the water. But he says there is another birth that's of the spirit. spirit. All right, keep going. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Keep going. Marvel not that I said unto you, you must be born again. Next verse. The way, and, and, and this is how he describes it. See, we had a, we had a problem trying to, because it felt so unusual until when we tried to articulate it and put it into music, we lied about it because we couldn't explain it. Y'all don't remember? I looked at my hands and my hands looked new. I looked at my feet and my feet did too. If you had gout in your feet before you accepted Jesus, unless he healed you, that gout and that corn was still there. <laughs> because, listen, because the change is not natural. The change is an inward change. When you accept Jesus Christ, immediately your spirit awakens to God. Y'all don't understand what I'm just saying. As, trust me, if you're in here today and you're not saved, I guarantee you, if you accept Jesus Christ, as soon as you ask him to be your savior, there is something that's going to happen before you can, before you can blink your eye. Your spirit is going to become alive to God. And, and, and we had a problem explaining what that felt like because to me it felt like somebody had lifted this imaginary load off my shoulders. I, re I believe I could fly. I, I, I felt, y'all, I'm sorry for bringing something secular into the, but it just felt like, uh, we used to sing it like this. I feel better, so much better since I laid my burdens down. What were we saying? When I accepted Jesus and my spirit became alive, it literally felt like a weight had been lifted. Can I tell you what that was? It was the weight of your judgment and the weight of the curse. Because the Bible says that he has become a curse for us that we might receive the blessing of God. Okay, now let's go to the last verse. Uh, go to 318. There's one more. Go to John 3.16, I'm sorry, my bad. John 3.16. Y'all know it, because in this one verse, are y'all with me so far? I, I want to make sure every, we're on this train together. In this one verse, we find the cause, the condition. We find the cause, the cost, the condition, and the consequence of salvation. Let me say it again. We find the cause, the cost, the condition, and the consequence of salvation. The Word of God says that for God so loved the world... He was motivated by love. What we do in the household of faith must always be motivated by love. The Bible says that men will know that you are my disciples not by the number of people in your fellowship, not by the light show that you put on during praise and worship, not by any of these things, but people will know that you identify with me and I identify with you by the love that you share one with another. If you don't experience love anywhere else, you ought to be loved when you come into the house of God. He says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That's the cost. That whosoever believeth in him, that's the condition. And here are the consequences. Should not perish but have everlasting life. And so the way that we come into the house is, okay, let me say it this way. How can you be saved if you don't realize you're lost? Let me say it again. How can you be saved if you don't realize you're lost? Sometimes we're like men drivers. When, when men drive, one of the things they hate to do is admit that they're lost. A man will drive for 30 minutes before he admits that he took the wrong turn. And the woman just sitting there shaking your head, come on, man, you know you lost. Oh, no, it was just the GPS. No, you are lost. Well, unless I get you to recognize that you are lost, you'll never see the need for a Savior. And so here's the thing. I must be able to recognize my lost state in the presence of a holy and a mighty God. What do you mean I must be able to recognize and acknowledge my lost state in the presence of a holy and a righteous God? I want you to take a look at Luke chapter 15. You all know the story. Uh, most of you do. Luke chapter 15 Jesus tells the story about a man who apparently was a man of means. He had two sons, a younger one and an older one. The younger one said, give me my inheritance now, and uh, I'm going to leave the house. Now, that was out of order, but he gave him the inheritance, and he left. 
The story goes on to say that he squandered everything that his father had given him. And uh, he found himself in an impoverished state to the degree that he was living uh, in hog pens and eating the slop that came to hogs. Now, if you know anything about Jews, Orthodox Jews, they have nothing to do with the swine. But the Bible says that when he was in that state, when he was there in the mud and the filth and the nastiness of it all, the Bible says, let's look at this, Luke chapter 15 and verse 17. This is an amazing verse. Luke chapter 15 and verse 17. He says, and when he, I just want to stop with this first part, and when he came to himself, those of you who are in here today, believe it or not, there was a moment when you had divine clarity and you came to yourself. It happens at different times. It can happen in your home. It can happen in the club. It can happen when you're in the wrong person's bedroom. See, God can find you wherever you are. You can't hide from him. And the Bible says that he came. In other words, I realized this is not how I'm supposed to live my life. This is not how I'm supposed to be. And do you know what he did? He got up and he went back home. Let me show you another instance. Because you have, it, it, it's, it's easy for us not to realize that we need a Savior. Do you know why? The Word of God says in Proverbs, there is a way which seemeth right unto men, but the ends thereof are death. We can always justify our lives. You know, I treat people right. I don't steal. I don't kill. I, do, I don't do any of, any of those things. You know, if I'm going to be a hypocrite, I'm going to be one outside of the church. We try to justify our behavior. But can I tell you something? I'm going to show you a scripture in just a minute where the Bible says that all of our righteousness. Don't you ever run your little self up in God's face talking about you do this and you do that and, and how righteous you are. If you are so righteous, Jesus could have stayed in heaven. He never had to go through the cross if, with your right self. And church folk are some of the worst. Now, again, we're talking about before I can get you saved and give you the keys to the house, you have to realize that you're lost. And for some of us, that's a hard thing to do. But watch this. Jesus, uh, Luke chapter 18 and verse 10. Jesus tells another story about two men who went into the sanctuary to pray. They had different mindsets. You see, one person wasn't even aware that he needed a Savior. The other person couldn't even lift his head up. All he could do is say, Lord, have mercy, you see? And there are so many church folk. You think you got it made. You think you're all of this, but you're mean, you're nasty, you'll cuss folk out in a minute. You've got unforgiveness in your heart, and you don't understand the thing that separates us from God. See, you're so bad. Well, you shouldn't drink, and you shouldn't smoke. Jesus said your mind is all messed up. It's nothing that goes into your body that causes you to be defiled before God. It's what comes out of your heart that causes you to be jacked up and messed up. If you're a racist, if you're a liar, if you're a cheater, if you like to God, he said that's the stuff that gets you on the wrong side of me. Not that you drink a glass of wine every now and then. Oh, they're going to throw me out of the church, but that's all right. I know I just told you the truth. All right, now, look at Luke chapter 18 and verse 14. Two men went into the temple to pray. This is Jesus talking. One a Pharisee, say church folk. church folk. One of them was a church guy. And the other guy, he was a club guy. He was a sinner. Let's just say he was a pimp. He was doing some low down and dirty stuff, but he found his, even pimps find their way to church every now and then. All right. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus within himself, God, I thank you that I am not as other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. Y'all have never heard the righteous, the self-righteous, condescending conversations of Christians? <laughs> Then he goes on to say, I fast twice a week. I'm on it, Jesus. I give tithes of all that I possess, Jesus. I'm on it. And the publican standing afar off, didn't even get close. He just stood back and let the other man just say every, everything he had to say. But I don't know about you. I feel like this guy. I have no right to stand before him. I have no right to be here today. I have no right to claim him as my father. But he stooped down and he found me in my sin sick self. And he picked me up and washed me and saved me and gave me help and he gave me hope. Yes, he said he wouldn't even lift up his eyes unto heaven, but he smote upon his breast saying, God, be merciful unto me, a sinner. Jesus said, I tell you, this man went down to his house, how? Justified. But the self-righteous one? who didn't think that Jesus could do anything for him, he said the other, for every one that exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbles himself shall be 
exalted. All right, so let's go ahead and finish this up. There's a couple of things I want to talk to you about because we're talking about how you get into the house. First of all, I want to talk to you about two things. I want to talk to you about the penalty, and then I want to talk to you about the pardon. The penalty and the pardon. Now listen to this. Um, you know, when you, normally when you have to go to trial and, and you've been indicted, before you've been indicted, a grand jury, after you've been accused of a crime, a grand jury has to look at the evidence and then they will issue an, an indictment and then you are officially arrested or charged with that crime. Can I tell you something this morning? Everybody in here, we all caught a charge. Amen. I'm going to say it again. Every one of us in here, as far as God is concerned, we all have caught a charge. Every one of us in here was found guilty. Every pope, every bishop, every apostle, I don't care what your title is or how many robes you put on, the Bible says we all have been found guilty. Let me show you this in Scripture. Take a look at this. Um, look at Romans chapter 3 and verse number 10. See, how can, you get, how can anybody get saved unless you realize the wretched state that you're in? I don't care what kind of car you drive. I don't care how many square feet your house is. I don't care what your bank account looks like. Can I tell you something? You can be materially rich and spiritually bankrupt. You can have everything. Do you know that there was a man, uh, I want to say his name was Diabetes. No, no, that was a beggar. There was a man who was rich and wealthy, and the Bible says that uh, every day he came out of his gate, there was a poor beggar that was laid at his gate. So he saw this man every day, kind of like the person that you see at the corner with a sign that says, we'll work for food. And when you pull up to the corner, you look everywhere else <laughs> but at that guy. <laughs> Somebody say amen. I know I'm, I know I'm preaching right, but anyway. And uh, he walked, this man begged every day, and he walked by this man and never gave him anything. But the common denominator of life met them both. They both died. And the Bible says that the poor guy, the beggar that begged every day, he was carried in Abraham's bosom to a place called paradise. But the other guy, the rich man, he lifted up his eyes in Sheol, in hell. And he said, Jesus, he said, I don't want my brothers to come to this place. He said, C can I go back? And, uh, and, and tell him about, he said, no. He said, you, you can't go over to them and they can't come over to you. He said, can you send a prophet? He said, they got plenty of preachers. They're not listening to the prophets that they have, you see? And, and, and so there's two places that we go. But let me get back to my main text. Um, Romans chapter 3 and verse number 10, we're all guilty. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. Have you ever heard people say stuff like this? Well, you know, my granddaddy built the church. You know, he, he was a, my daddy was a mason, and he, he was a preacher, and, you know, and, and I do this, and I do that. Do you honestly think that you're going to stand before God, and he's going to say, okay, we're going to welcome you into heaven based upon your good works? I'm going to show you a scripture that just condemns everything I just said in just a few minutes. Here's another verse that I want you to see. Romans 3, 23. Listen to how I read. Y'all have my notes, right? Romans 3, 23. Hallelujah salvation and glory all right now let's look at this for y'all have sinned and come short of the glory of God no not me y'all <laughs> because when some folks read it it sounds like they're not talking about themselves it's all of y'all but but not me no he said all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Don't you miss that. And this is why I stay away from judgment. Because when I look at my life, stuff that you all don't know about, I find no room or occasion for me to judge someone else because I got too much stuff I'm dealing with myself. You see? And so I can't look at you and say, y'all have sinned. I don't care what the situation is or how awesome or how ugly it sounds. When I get by myself and I process that not as a pastor but as a person, I cannot judge anyone else's behavior because I have to stay on my knees and pray to God to keep the blood covering me. So all have sinned and we've come short of the glory of God. I want to give you one more. I'm driving home a point. Look at Isaiah chapter 64 and 6. We're talking about keys to the house. How do I get into the house? And right now we're talking about the penalty and the pardon. Isaiah 64 and 6 says this, but we're all an unclean thing. See, I know you thought, me? I know he's not talking about me. I take a bath. I, I've got good hygiene. I ain't stink. I got on some sure right now. Amen. He says we are all an unclean thing. And all, all of our righteousness are as filthy rags. 
and we all do fade as a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. That is a universal indictment. Before Jesus Christ, all of us have caught a charge. Every last one of us is guilty of something. Amen? Amen. We're going to get there. We're going to show you how to get in the house. Now, listen, um, let me show you something else. Do you know that even before you were born, you were still unrighteous? When God created Adam and, and, and God placed Adam in the garden, he gave him one commandment. He said, do not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. He said, in the day that you do that, you shall die. When Adam disobeyed God, every human being that has ever come into the earth after that, we inherited his, uh, his sinful nature. We inherited his nature to disobey. If you don't believe that, one of the most amazing things in this season of my life, you got to learn how to recognize what season that you're in is just watching my young grandson grow up. Because as cute and as handsome as he is, you don't have to tell him how to do wrong. You don't have to tell any child how to do wrong. It's built in. Did you listen to me? It is built in. If you don't believe it, watch a little child grow up. He's going to crawl around and be innocent and pretty. After a while, he's going to be something that we call mischievous. You don't have to teach a child how to lie. It comes naturally. You don't have to teach a child how to steal and sneak. It comes naturally. You don't have to teach a child how to be selfish. It comes naturally. <laughs> Every now and then, he'll be eating something. I said, I say, no, give me some. No, Papa. I'm like, boy, you better give me. I'll take it if you won't give it to me. <laughs> but, but, but anyway, do you understand what I'm saying? We all inherit that. So, so we come into the world messed up, but we don't want to acknowledge that we're messed up. But we come into this world messed up, and the workings of sin are already built into us. Let me show you something um, that uh, David said about being born. I need you all to find that scripture for me. I got it. I think it's Psalms 51 and 5. I want to show you this. We're talking about the penalty. And then we're going to celebrate with a pardon. Psalms 51 and 5 says this, Behold, can, uh, let, can we switch that to the NIV? There's something I want them to see today. Um, again, Psalms 51 and 5. It says this, Surely I was sinful at birth. Isn't that a hard pill to swallow? Surely I was sinful at birth. Sinful from the time my mother conceived me. He said, behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. We were born of sinful flesh. Oh, no, no, not me, Pastor. My, my mother was a deacon when I was born, and, <laughs> and, and, and my father was a pastor when I was born. As a matter of fact, they told me a story that when I was in my mother's womb, it, 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 it wasn't, you know, embryonic fluid. I, I was, it, was whole, it, it, it was It was anointing oil. And when I was born, I came out shining and speaking in tongues. <laughs> Amen. But David said, no, that's not the case. He said, behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. The nature was already built into me. That's why when we come into this earth, it is easier for us to do something sinful than it is for us to do something righteous. Do you know the Bible says learn to do good? We have to be taught. Remember I told you last week, I said home is the place of first instruction, the household. That's where we learn things called manners. That's where we learn home training, okay? Are y'all with me so far? Am I boring you yet? All right. Now, let's take a look at this. Romans 5 and 12. It is our nature. Romans 5 and 12 says this. We'll see what it says in just a minute. Uh, it says, wherefore, as by one man... Look at this, because remember I told you we all inherited Adam's sinful nature. The Bible says, as by one man sin entered the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon to who, how many men? All. How many? All. For that who has sinned? All. Just raise your hand and say, I was guilty. I was guilty. Yeah, pl please don't hold your hand down. Just put it up and say, I was guilty. I was guilty. Yeah, we were. All right. Now, even our own nature... Even after we're saved, our own nature, our own struggle testifies to the fact that we inherited Adam's sinful nature. Look at Romans. Paul talked about it. How many of you ever said, you know, I'm not going to do that anymore? And before the end of the day, you did it. And then you got upset with yourself because you did it. And then when you really thought about it, you couldn't figure out why you did it. Have you ever sinned and said, and then after, after your flesh was satisfied, you said this, I don't know why I did that. I didn't even want to do that when I started. And now you're feeling bad. 
Do you know why you're feeling bad? Because the Holy Ghost lives in you. And before you did that, the Holy Spirit was trying to tell you, don't do that. Don't do that. You tried to call the person for the hookup and all the lines were down. When you got ready to go and see them, you had a flat tire, had to call AAA to boost you off. When you got to the hookup point, they left because you were late. And you all upset and you don't realize God was trying to help your little silly butt right then. <laughs> uh, y'all never had, you didn't realize it was God keeping you, but God has, a lot of stuff God kept us and, and we were mad at him because he kept us. <laughs> all right. What, okay, now look at Paul, what Paul talks about in Romans chapter 7. Paul says, now, now understand who I'm talking about. I'm not just talking about any preacher. I'm talking about the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul who by revelation wrote 75% of the New Testament. The Apostle Paul who opened blind eyes, called men from the dead, who cast out demons. This Apostle Paul, look at what he says. He says, wherefore, as by... Nah, Romans chapter 7, Romans chapter 7, verses 18 through 20. Let's just be patient. Let's love, because we're all in one family. We're going to love on everybody. <laughs> Even the sound booth people, we're going to love on them. Hallelujah. Amen. Romans chapter 7. And uh, can y'all get me Romans chapter 7 and verse 18, please? Romans chapter 7 and verse number 18. We got it? All right. For I know that in me, I wish we all would come to this revelation, because <laughs> sometimes we think we're all of that in a bag of chips. He says, for I know that in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. Flesh. It's not so much talking about the skin as it is our fallen nature. There is nothing good about our fallen nature. He says, for to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good? He said, I, I find not. Have you ever been to the altar with tears running down your face and you felt that at that moment I have now experienced the deliverance of God and I will never, ever go back there again? When she calls me or he calls me again, I'm going to hang up the phone and say, I'm a, I'm a new creature in Christ. That's what you said when you were at the altar around Wednesday. <laughs> around about 8 o'clock, you got a phone call. You know, girl, I've been thinking about you, and, uh, you know, I really want to get serious in life, and um, I, I don't want, you know, I'm tired of wilding out, you know. Um, I want to settle down. I'm tired of running around. I would do it again if I can. Y'all don't know that's an old song, but anyway. And uh, can, can, can I come over and talk about it? Now, everything is, in your body is telling you. No, you don't have to come over for us to talk about it. We can talk about it on the phone. But there's another part of you that's saying, you know, I'm, I'm here by myself. And <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm feeling some kind of way. Let's come over. Let's talk about it. All right. <laughs> then after everything is said and done and eyes are closed, but yours are open and you're looking up at the ceiling. Why did I do that? I didn't really want to want to do that. I wish I could make this joker get up and go home because I don't want him in my bed no more. Do you see how this thing can change and vacillate and go back and forth? But let me tell you something. Be glad for that feeling because if that feeling goes away, you're in trouble. When you can sin without any type of conviction, not condemnation, but when you can sin without any type of conviction, when you can cuss people out and feel nothing, when you can say malicious and mean things and, and feel absolutely nothing, when you can look somebody straight in the eye and tell a bald-faced lie and feel absolutely nothing, you are in trouble with the Holy Ghost. Because the Holy Ghost is an indicator. How many of you have a, listen, maybe you don't know it, but in your car, you have a light that very rarely comes on, but there's a light that's called the check. When the check engine is, light, it, it is on, listen, your car will still start with the check engine light on. You can still drive your car with the check engine light on. You can go anywhere you want to with the check engine light on but what that light is telling you there's something wrong with the mechanical mechanisms of this car and if you keep operating like that with the check engine light on after a while something is going to break
How loud is the Holy Spirit screaming out in your life? And there's this red flashing light. says, check engine, check engine. The way you behaved in the grocery store, so check the engine light. The way you behaved towards your spouse, check the engine light. The way you gossiped and lied on that preacher, check your engine light. Y'all can sit there like you don't know what I'm talking about, but you know exactly what I'm talking about. And so Paul says, let, let, let's keep going. I didn't finish that. He says, for the good I would do, I do not. But the evil which I would not, that I do. You know what? Every now and then God will give you a moment to pause before you do evil. When I start talking about evil, I don't get a whole lot of amens. But, uh, sometimes when I'm driving, before I'm getting ready to do evil, <laughs> if, if God doesn't tell me I have a person sitting to my right normally who is God in the car <laughs> alright and she, she must be just right up there with God because she knows when I'm going to do wrong before I do it <laughs> if somebody passes me wrong she'll say uh 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 because she already knows now I'm at the point where I pause and I reflect and I think about well, if an accident happens, well, if this happens, because something happened to me not too long ago. I, one of my little cars is very, very fast. And I was going down the road one day with the top down. And you know how, you, how you're in this lane, here's another lane, and this is going slow and I need to get over here and pass, right? So when I sped up, this guy sped up. So we were doing about 90 or so, you know. <laughs> and we were coming up behind a trailer. I never will forget this. Y'all laughing, but this was serious to me. It had lawnmower stuff on it. And so I dropped it to another gear and I hit it, right? So now I'm doing about a hundred and something. Deborah's sitting over there. She, her nails are digging into the dashboard. <laughs> and when I get up behind this car, I didn't, listen to me, I didn't even know if I was going to make it. I just swerved over, doing all, over a hundred miles an hour. And I thought about this. What if that car had clipped the back end of your car? Your car is down. You may have seat belts on, but your wife's going to get thrown out. You're going to get thrown out. Your family could be without a father. Your church could be without a pastor, all because of some foolishness you're doing out here on the road. And so I said that to say this. Every now and then, God will give us grace, and we will start to pause and reflect before we act. Y'all have never been there? If you hadn't, just keep on living. I promise you, you're going to get to a place where before you act, you're going to stop and pause. All right, now watch this. Let's keep going. He said, now, if I do that, I would not. He says, no more I. Uh, that do it. He said, but it's, it's sin that dwells in me, you see. And so all of us can relate to Paul, you see. And that's why we're talking about the penalty. Let's go ahead and shift to the pardon. Because do you understand when you talk about how to get in the household that all of us really should be locked out? You miss what I just said. When you talk about this household of faith, every one of us should be locked out. But let me show you something. How do I get in the house? Ask your neighbor, say, Pastor, how do I get in the house? One more scripture before we talk about the pardon. Romans 6, 23. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of the Spirit is eternal life. I want you to think about this. The wages. Wages of something that you earn. Isn't it a horrible thing to live your life raising hell and then go to hell? Now, it's important that you understand what hell is. Okay. Hell, in God's mind, is eternal separation from the life and the light and the love of God. Now, I want you to understand this, what hell is like, okay? The Bible says that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If you take away the presence of light, what do you have? Most of you have never seen the kind of darkness that I'm talking about. Do you know that there is a darkness that exists that even if you hold your hand out in front of your face, you cannot see it, all right? That's in the natural. But there is a spiritual darkness, absence from the light, the life, and the love of God. And God says, if you don't choose the right door to come in, when you close your eyes, you never die. You just change houses. You lay this house down. We put this house in the dirt. You never lose consciousness. Either you transition to where you're in the presence of God or you're in a place where you, you'll never, ever, ever have a chance to come back from that place. That's called hell. I don't know about you. I ain't going there. And if there's fire in hell, I'm definitely not going. Because as hot as it gets here on the earth, every time I walk out in Florida sunshine, I realize just how convicted I am and how determined I am to go to heaven. I ain't going to hell. 
Not because I did something so good, but because I understand the keys. All right, now look at this. Now, let me show you how God feels about all of this, the penalty and the pardon. Do you know that it's not God's will that any human being perish and go to hell? Well, you say, Pastor, you know, I've heard people say that, that God sends people to hell. God has never sent anyone to hell. If you go, it's because you chose to go. If you go, it's because you chose not to accept his alternative. And so you can't rightly say, God sent me there. If you end up there, you have to say, this is what I chose and live with it. All right? Now, let me show you this. Second Peter 3 and 9. I'm showing you how it's not God's will for you to perish. The word of God says, the Lord is not, can we, let me see, let's see, I think, I think I saw another one that was really, really good concerning this scripture. Um, let's try, can, can you grab the Amplified Translation back in the back? I think that was the one I was studying that said it really, really well. Let's, let's give them a moment. Now watch this. The Lord does not delay and is not tardy or slow about what he's promised. You know, you hear people saying, the world's coming to an end. We're in the last days. You've been, I've been hearing that all my life. And you think it's not going to happen. Or God's just slow. It's all a story. It's all a fairy tale. And there's a reason why it's taking so long. He's waiting on you. Look at what he says. The Lord does not delay and is not tardy or slow about what he promises, according to some people's conception of slowness. But he is long-suffering, extraordinarily patient towards you not desiring that any should perish but that all do you see that but that all should turn to repentance the king is that all should be saved and so what God is saying is I'm waiting on you now I don't know about you but I'm glad he waited on me because I took a circuitous route to get to him what I mean by that is this I was baptized when I was six years old in the Baptist church but that was just a function for me I ran around and messed with them little girls and did everything I wanted to do while I was in church. I was in the house, but not in the household. You can be in the house and not be in the household. When I got into college and I first joined the Air Force, oh, I, the Holy Ghost hit me again, oh, and I got baptized again. That was two times, and that one didn't take. All right. <laughs> I'm not trying to dissuade you all about baptism, but I'm telling you my personal testimony. And I was all right for a while, but, but the lights were still shining and, and the drink was still drink and, and everything else was still everything else. And, and eventually, you know what I did? I, I fell away. All right. And I stayed away from a while. But then I got baptized the third time and the third time it took. Hallelujah. <laughs> and I haven't looked back since. What I'm telling you is, is this walk is not a perfect walk. You, you start out and you struggle. Sometimes you take one step forward and you take two back. But if you stay with the Lord, after a while, you'll start taking two steps forward and one back. After a while, you'll start taking three steps forward and one back. After a while, you start saying, I won't look back. I can't go. And you go on about your business, you see. But it is a process. And the way that the old folk used to sing, sing it, they sing it like this. Hold to his hand, God's unchanging hand. You ought to hold. Y'all remember that? Okay. <laughs> yeah, y'all Baptists. All right. <laughs> now. So we can agree that God doesn't want us to go to hell. If we go to hell, it's because of what we did, not what he did. All right, now, let's look at this. God loves you so much that he paid the ultimate sacrifice. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Here's how you get the key. And he that believes on him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Isaiah said it this way. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities and the chastisement of our peace. Pastor, what do you mean the chastisement of our peace? Everything that you saw Jesus go through, the humiliation, the pain, the suffering, the beating, all of that, that and more should have been our punishment. And so when he was hanging there on the grave, on the cross, most of us thought that the Roman government and the Sanhedrin put him to death. It really had very little to do with that. What was happening is something that was spiritual and dynamic that they could not see. When the soldier that was standing next to Jesus, when he died, he caught a glimpse of it and he stopped. He said, surely, surely this must be the Son of God. 
Even Herod's wife had a dream and God tried to tell her and she woke up and she went and told her husband, you know what, don't you bother this man. We need to leave this man alone. The spiritual dynamic was so awesome that when Jesus hung his head and gave up the ghost, the Bible said that there was a violent earthquake that shook the ground. The Bible says there was a complete solar eclipse. The sun went away in blood. The Bible says that graves shook so hard that dead people got up and walked the streets of Jerusalem while he died. They hung, I feel like, mm. they hung him high and they stretched him wide. They laughed at him and mocked him while he was on the cross. And they didn't realize that their blood was on him. He was dying for them. Then he hung his head and he gave up the ghost. The disciples were crying. Mary was crying. The apostles had run away in fear. And they took his broken, battered body down. And they wrapped it up. And it was not even enough money to buy him a tomb. They had to borrow a tomb. There was got Nicodemus? Guess what? Nicodemus donated a tomb for Jesus to be buried in. And they put him in that tomb. And they shut the tomb. And everybody went away crying. Everybody went away thinking that, wow, we put our hopes in this guy. He said he was the son of God. We thought he was the Messiah. We thought he was going to turn things around for us. And they walked away, heads down and disheartened. But a few days later, (laughs) Mary and Martha said, let's let's go and let's anoint his dead body. They were so overtaken with sorrow, they forgot about something. They forgot that if we get there, while they were walking, it dawned upon them, we can't roll the stone away. We're two women. But when they got there, they looked and, ooh, somebody rolled away. The, and then they saw this guy, big and bold and standing. And he said, why seek you the living among the dead? He is not here. He has risen. And they ran back and told the disciples, I don't know about you, but I'm glad he got up. I'm glad he got up. He conquered death. He conquered hell. He conquered the brave, the grave. He conquered the devil. He got up with all power in his hands. He took my sin. He took my judgment. He took my condemnation. He gave me his righteousness. He gave me his right. He gave me the keys. And now I'm a part of the household. If you're in the house, stand to your feet and celebrate. I'm in the house. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Sit down for a minute. I need every head bowed and every eye closed. Somebody may be watching and somebody may be here and they may be saying, Pastor, what must I do to get access into the house? It's found in Romans chapter 10. Please put that on the screen, Romans 10, 10 through 13. Because the question was asked, do you have keys to the house? Look at Romans chapter 10, verse 10. Through 13, please. For with the heart, man believes unto righteousness. In other words, what I just preached to you, you got to believe that in here. It says, and with the mouth, confession is made unto self. You got to open your mouth and say something. The next verse says this. For the scripture saith, whosoever believes on him shall not be ashamed. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord is Lord over all and rich unto all that call upon him. There's a verse that says this, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord, not maybe not might, but they shall be saved. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. <laughs> Saints of God are praying. If you realize that after all this time, I've been going to church, but I'm not in the house, and you want to get the keys to the house, all you have to do is believe what I just preached to you, that Jesus took your punishment, <laughs> He took your curse upon himself, and he died as a proxy for you. And your response should be, Lord, can I live my life for you? Heads are bowed, eyes are closed, saints of God are praying. If today you want to acknowledge Jesus Christ, if you want to ask him into your life as your Savior, I want you to make your way up front. Now, this is going to be a threefold altar call. That altar call is out there. Here it is. Here's the other one. You may be saved, but you've just been away from the house. You're part of the household, but you've just been away for a while. 
and today you want to come back to the house. So if you want to be saved, if you want to rededicate yourself, we want you to come forward now. I need you all playing, and I need you all praying. And let's see. Just begin to pray. If you're in this place today, and you want to make sure that when I leave here, I'm all right with God, and God is all right with me. If you're in this place today, and you are part of the household, but you just got away from it, and you want to rededicate and recommit, we want to give you an opportunity to come back today. Amen. Let's give the Lord praise, because I'm just going to assume that everyone in here is saved. Let me, um, let me share with you all my biggest concern before we go home today. You know what my biggest concern is when I preach and when I minister? Is did you understand what I said? Were you able to put the dots together? Were you able to connect the dots? Because once I've given you the truth, then I've done what I'm supposed to do. Anything else that happens after that, that's on you. That's not on me. And so as long as I can rest and, and I can tell God, God, I did the best I could, and they understood what was said, then I can go home and everything is going to be all right. Thank you guys for coming and worshiping with us today at the River of Life Christian Center. You are a part of the household of faith. We are one community. We are one culture, one family. And if you're not a part of this family, please just pray and, and talk to the Lord about it. We really would have, we really want you to be a part of our household. Amen? Did you get anything out of the Word of God today? Yeah. Hallelujah. Amen. Now unto him who is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we could ever ask or think according to the power that works in us. To the God who declares, I'm able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before my presence with exceeding glory. To you, O God, we give the glory. To you, O God, we give the honor. And to you, O God, we give the praise. And until we come together again in this household as a family of faith, may God's richest and God's best be yours. God bless you guys. Have a wonderful Sunday.